Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Luxembourg PVC Stories. Today's guest is Markus Langner. He's Managing Director and taking care of business development at Capital Dynamics. Hi, Markus. Hi, Stefan. Thanks for having me here. A real pleasure. So let's get started. What can you tell us about Capital Dynamics? Who, when and how did that whole adventure start? So Capital Dynamics is a global independent private asset manager. What do we focus on? It's three areas. It's mid-market private equity, mid-market credit, and it's clean energy. We have uh, 13 billion, over 13 billion assets under management, uh, and we've built a, a client base that includes over 550 institutional clients and over 900 uh, private wealth clients. On the institutional investor side, it's all segments, uh, pension funds, insurances, endowments, family offices, um, etc. So that's, that's basically the, the setup. Um, Capital Dynamics was founded by a, a Swiss guy called um, Thomas Huber back in 1999. He's a, a rocket scientist, uh, studied, um, studied that in, in the United States and uh, founded the company in 1999 to really yeah, bring private equity to another level. He basically invented the securitization of uh, private equity portfolios. So that's our history. Great story. Um, what can you tell us about your main verticals in addition to the different elements you highlighted? And what kind of typical investments are you doing, executing? And finally, how do you source those? Right. So I mentioned that we have what well, two two main air businesses two pillars it's our global mid-market business on the one hand side and the clean energy renewable energy business on the other hand the uh, global mid-market uh, business divides into two segments the private equity business um, and the private credit business and the private equity business actually divides further in in three areas the others don't so <laughs> it's it's five in total uh, but the three uh, private equity businesses are primaries, uh, secondaries, and, and co-investing. So in primaries, we, we invest in funds. You know, we are a fund investor, a fund of fund. Uh, that's uh, part, of, uh, part of the history. And here the sourcing is the, the GP network uh, we've built over three decades, actually, um, with, uh, with one of our partners. Um, and now it's over 350 uh, GPs that, uh, that we have in our primary investing business. Um, the second business is co-investing. Here we invest alongside those funds we invest in on the primary business um, as, uh, as minority investors. And they're actually the key source of uh, sourcing is the primary investing team. So the fund relationships the primary team has is important uh, for the co-investment team. Um, especially since we uh, basically almost get uh, fee-free and carry-free uh, co-investing from, from these GPs. That co-investment team has its own uh, uh, sourcing uh, network, of course, but the primary business is a key element. And then the third pillar of the, uh, the, uh, the private equity business is secondaries. And here also the primary fund investing is, is very key. Here it's less so in sourcing, uh, but it's very key in that a lot of the secondary transactions need GP approval. And since we have this relationship with 350 plus GPs, we are a preferred buyer in, in secondary uh, uh, transactions. The sourcing is typically done by intermediaries in the, uh, in the uh, secondary business, although there are also a good number of proprietary transactions from GPs, from LPs, um, so secondaries has, has really a wide uh, a sourcing angle. And then the, private, the mid market private credit uh, business is focused on sponsored transactions. That means it's private equity financed, private equity buyout transactions. And we do that in the US lower mid market. And again, here is a nice synergy with all of the private equity businesses because it's these same 350 GPs that we work with on primary, secondaries, on co-investing on, uh, on the private equity side, we also work with on the private credit side. Finally, <laughs> on, the, uh, on the credit, uh, sorry, on the clean energy business, it's a slightly different uh, business there. We are a direct investor. We own 100% of the assets 
And here our key approach to sourcing is uh, that we have uh, exclusive uh, relationships with developers of renewable projects and through those we, we, source, uh, we source those projects. It's a very interesting setup and it's very well integrated as I understand, specifically as you mentioned, the different synergies that you find between the different teams and also within then your GP network, etc. Absolutely. Great. Markus, uh, can you tell us what happened at Capital Dynamics over the last two years? So yeah, a lot has happened in the last two years. Uh, uh, yeah, very, very challenging environment. I'm personally uh, uh, involved in, in business development, so that's sort of my uh, yeah, special view of the business. So I'll just tell you a perspective of that. And actually, uh, fundraising has been very good over the last uh, two years. So if I just go through the verticals I've just talked about, if we start uh, from the left, from, from my view, uh, perspective, private equity uh, primaries, uh, we've just recently uh, uh, closed a private equity funder fund focused on the, uh, the German-speaking region, a very ESG-focused fund at, at its target size. Um, moving on to the co-investment business, we've uh, just recently uh, closed our co-investment fund above the target, uh, which was 500 million at 580 million. And uh, by the final close, the performance of the fund has been tremendous. Uh, we've started, uh, we're lucky that we started investing after the outbreak of uh, COVID. So uh, my co-investment colleagues sort of looked at what was happening, thought about it, and then sort of selected industry sectors that would be winners uh, um, going forward. And that has turned out to be the case and, and the performance already at, uh, at final close was uh, fantastic. So um, as you can see, it's been uh, busy for us. <laughs> uh, and and uh, yeah, obviously all of this uh, money needs to be invested uh, well across these different strategies. Always good to hear and also specifically to underline the resilience of the sector and then specifically your activities. Um, as we all understood, you mentioned many times ESG. Uh, we certainly assume that you have an ESG policy and strategy. Uh, how important is that for your group? Yeah, so we have had an ESG policy um, and strategy for a, long, a, long, a very long time. We're actually one of the early signatories in the private asset industry in 2008. Um, you know, we think that's uh, early for, and uh, ESG is uh, at the heart of what we do. So we, we, we really want to be at the forefront of, of, of the ESG development. Uh, so we believe that responsible investment actually leads to superior uh, long-term uh, financial returns uh, and it also brings a closer alignment of objectives between investors, stakeholders and the, the wider society at, at large. Um, we believe the benefits of responsible investment include three elements. The first one is a risk reduction. That's very key. And that was sort of the traditional approach. You know, just don't invest anything that uh, could, could be problematic. Uh, it can be a cost reduction, for example, in um, environmental waste savings, gas savings. A very, for example, yes. <laughs> very, uh, a very uh, current example. And thirdly, and we, we see more and more examples of a positive impact uh, yeah, on, on the top line, not, not only on, on, on the bottom line or on risk. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that has those three, three elements. And we actually developed a, um, an, our own propriety uh, risk responsible investment um, strategy uh, rating system. It's called RI. Uh, it's a word on you know, abbreviation of RI, and I is the I. I could actually show you the I here. <laughs> I actually brought it with me um, anyway. Um, and basically there, uh, this rating system is based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. And depending on these verticals we talked about, they're slightly different uh, SDGs that apply, 10 to 12 of them. We basically um, use these SDGs in the underwriting process, and that's part of the decision making, and map against these criteria if we want to go ahead with this investment or not. You know, there are certainly investments that are then uh, not moved uh, uh, forward. Um, 
And then they are updated and monitored on a regular basis, at least yearly. And what we'd like to see is, yes, we want to filter out certain investments at the beginning that are just not, not good. But the more important role of private equity is active ownership. And, and during the time of ownership, uh, you actually want to you know, improve your companies. And therefore, we want to see that this RI rating uh, improves over time. And um, you know, just to, to finish up, to make this more concretely and, and where we're active, we've been active in a various uh, set of initiatives um, uh, around uh, ESG. Uh, for example, we just joined the, the Net Zero Asset Manager Initiative and uh, as a result of that set five-year uh, climate targets for operational and, and portfolio company uh, uh, levels. Uh, we are preparing for the European SFDR, Sustainable Finance Directive Regulation Reporting. That's a, a major undertaking. We're co-chair of the IIGCC's um, committee, um, the, the private equity committee, not the overall committee, uh, but the private equity focused one on uh, achieving net zero uh, emissions. And we've also partnered with a bunch of or several uh, organizations that help diversity and inclusion. Now, here in Europe, environmental is more important. In the US, uh, diversity and inclusion is actually uh, quite important. And yeah, and all of this activity has been uh, recognized, for example, by the United Nations uh, Principle for Responsible in Investing. So um, certainly uh, shown that what, what, what we've been doing over the last decade or so is, is getting recognition as well. That again is a very passionate engagement, but you highlight also the, uh, let's say, non-financial performance in which you believe the different reasons why you do it. That's really great. Um, what can you tell us about your operating model and the composition of your team? I mean, globally and in Luxembourg, and certainly how do you see right now Luxembourg? Right, so the, the global setup, I've talked a bit briefly before. So we're 160 people, uh, 14 offices, half of them in, in Europe um, and yeah, very much uh, actually our organization is pretty similar to these verticals that, uh, that I've shared. With respect to, to Luxembourg, we've actually been active here since 2009. Uh, it started off that we had German tax-exempt investors who needed a, a good uh, fund uh, structure um, and we found it here, <laughs> right there. <laughs> um, um, anyway, that, that Luxembourg uh, ZCAP SCA has, um, has grown over time. It was started off with an umbrella fund with one uh, compartment. It now has over 15 compartments. Um, it's really uh, has grown over time, um, not the compartments, but obviously uh, also all the, uh, um, the assets. And we don't only have uh, German LPs in these vehicles anymore, but also other European, US, and, and Asian investors. I, I was really quite surprised how, you know, how, how wide uh, this, uh, this interest is. And we have uh, one Luxembourg-based LPs, and also other European LPs who've set up, like us, set up their vehicle in, um, uh, in, in Luxembourg. So um, that, that, that has worked uh, well. So yeah, from our perspective, yeah, Luxembourg for us has become the preferred location um, in, in Europe um, yeah, for, for both uh, GPs and, and LPs. Uh, there's been tremendous growth, but there has also been some growing pains. And I think it has been quite a, at times a, a stretch for the different service providers which are involved in, in this journey. So on our end, uh, um, yeah, we were sometimes not so happy with uh, the quality and response times that we've, uh, we've received. Uh, so from our perspective, our plea to uh, Luxembourg uh, service providers is hire more people, hire more good people that uh, you, know, you can continue to, to, to build your business. We know this is not easy. Uh, we're in the process of hiring people here as well. Uh, which brings me to the next point. We actually opened our, so until this year we didn't have an office, but we just opened our uh, Luxembourg office earlier this year, and we're in the process of obtaining an AFM approval, uh, hopefully 
later this year. And uh, yeah, this, uh, yeah, the, our Luxembourg office will, will grow going forward. Great to hear that uh, you have chosen now Luxembourg as a profit hub and which will allow you then to also grow in, in the future further. Certainly for the talents uh, element, that's why we also try as an association with the community to work also on that matter, propose different trainings and also job fairs, etc. But we know this is an important challenge which we need to master in the future for sure. Now on the more personal angle, Markus, can you tell us what you studied and how you entered the private equity field? Yeah. So. Um I was born and raised in, in, in Germany, um, but I actually then studied uh, chemical engineering and international relations uh, at Brown University and MIT in the US. So uh, a good amount of time spent there. As I, a few years later, I received an, an MBA at INSEAD in France. Uh, I wanted to study in, in Europe. And uh, after my initial studies, I actually went to work in, in Boston um, where I had studied uh, and was in strategy consulting with a company called uh, The Monitor Group, which has now become part of uh, Deloitte uh, Consulting and uh, moved to Germany in, in the late or in 1997. Uh, I moved into private asset management in 2005 and been active there ever since. Fantastic, and that also underlines how you can enter the field, so either with, uh, let's say, science degree, adding some um, MBA and finance studies afterwards, working in strategic consulting, and then for GPs. That's really a very nice pathway. Uh, what kind of advice would you like to give to young talents who would like to really enter the field a little bit like you did? Um, yeah, along, I guess along the lines of what, uh, what we've just said. So. People, uh, uh, students in a similar situation to myself back then, uh, who did undergraduate studies in, in non-business areas, uh, the uh, the MBA was really a great way to to get more business uh, knowledge, and, and on top of that, uh, a very good uh, a network. Um, it's actually through my INSEAD network that I I found my. Uh, my, uh, you know, my transition into to private asset management. Um, then also, yeah, you can go directly into private asset management, private equity uh, these days, but um, there are also indirect ways and, and strategy consulting, I can say, is, is a great way. Uh, it's, a, it's a fast learning track. You learn about different industries and, um, and functions in business, which you know, is, is very good. Uh, a very good uh, toolbox to, to apply in the private equity industry. Any specific values you personally like to see with candidates or new colleagues? Personal qualities, I would say open-mindedness, um, flexibility and sort of uh, uh, seek, seeking uh, knowledge and uh, sort of always Asking, asking why. So ambition, curiosity, hard work, I assume too? Hard, uh, hard work, yes, a uh, good part of it, but I think also knowing where your limits are and, and telling, telling people, uh, you know, saying no and not always saying yes. Um, I certainly learned, uh, learned that as a, a, a rookie uh, management consultant. Um, that, that was more, uh, sometimes longer hours than it was necessary. <laughs> okay, so that's also a good hint. <laughs> Any specific leader or person who inspired you uh, and also motivated you during your career? So one, uh, one person who uh, uh, has motivated and inspired me is uh, Jack Welch, the former CEO of um, uh, General Electric. Uh, he is a chemical engineer, studied in um, in Massachusetts, I studied chemical engineering in Massachusetts. At least um, maybe there the commonalities end. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I found what uh, he's done at uh, GE uh, very impressive. How he turned this conglomerate ar around in in two decades as a, a, C a CEO was uh, quite Im impressive. Uh, not everything he did was perfect, uh, but I think that you know there's. Uh, that, that's part of the story, and he he pioneered a lot of things. He introduced a lot of things, Six Sigma, 
And uh, one thing that's sort of uh, used by us uh, these days as well as, you know, being, uh, GE was supposed to be number one or number two in the industry or, or sell uh, the business. Um, and that's certainly something uh, private equity is you know, trying to, to uh, uh, build uh, uh, market leaders or you know buy companies from <laughs> companies like uh, GE and uh, you know those are potential or these orphans corporate orphans and then really turn them into independent uh, market leaders um, so um, I, I had a, a two-year uh, period at, at Siemens and General Electric was sort of the, the company that was looked at I actually uh, have Three colleagues um, in our co-investment team who worked for General Electric uh, Capital um, in the 90s, and uh, they started co private equity co-investment them, and they had a numbers, uh, number of interactions with uh, Jack Welsh and spoke highly of him, tough as well. Um, and you know, a lot of the things they learned in, at GE, they, they applied, uh, they're applying in, in their daily business now. This is really a great example and also pushing people further into the system in order to, as you highlighted before, remain curious and learn with the best. Any uh, last recommendation you'd like to give now on the book side, music, uh, series, podcast, and in order to share that with our audience? Right. Um, so for the... For me, uh, it, it's a, a book... Um, um, it's, it's a business book, so still on the topic, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's really re relevant. I'd like to recommend Pioneering Portfolio Management, uh, first published in 2000 uh, by uh, David Swenson, uh, head of the uh, Yale um, University Endowment. Uh, why do I think this is so key? Because it, it has really been a blessing for the private equity business, he, because he basically, uh, you yeah, uh, his endowment or Yale model, as, as it became to be known, really pushed a lot of institutional investors in, or sort of was a key influence in increasing the, uh, the private equity allocation. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, the, he says that you should divide your portfolio in about five to six equal buckets. Uh, they should be uh, broadly diversified into different asset classes. You should have an equity orientation rather than a bond orientation. Um, and you should avoid asset classes like bonds, which if you looked at most uh, portfolios, and you still look in a lot of portfolios uh, today of institutional investors, they're uh, uh, full of bonds. Fair to say they're driven by regulatory requirements often. But uh, anyway, what the particularly revolu revolutionary uh, recognition was that liquidity is a bad thing to avoid. Before it was always liquidity is good and illiquidity and therefore private assets are not good because you know, liquid gets you things quickly but liquidity always often means lower returns and uh, if you can um, if you can live with an illiquidity premium which endowments can, which pension funds, insurance companies can then um, yeah uh, then you can get a higher portfolio return, which you know, he, he has uh, generated. And a key element of, of that was yeah, relying on private equity and on investment managers like Capital Dynamics and other GPs. So uh, we can be really uh, uh, thankful to, uh, uh, to David Swenson and, and his work and the great uh, Yale, Yale uh, portfolio because yeah, it's, it's been a good uh, driver for all of us. So really a great advocate for our industry, really embedding long-term investments and also the value creation process. Great. I think let's add it then to our reading list. Markus, thanks a lot for sharing so many insights with our audience and community. And uh, dear friends of the LPA, we'll see you very soon for another episode. Goodbye.